Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome with a huge round of applause Honorable Dr. Justice Dhananjaya Pai Chattachu. My colleagues from the Supreme Court of India, Justice A.S. Bopanna, Justice B.B. Nagaratna, whom I very fondly call Nagu, <laughs> Justice Arvind Kumar, Chief Minister of Karnataka, Sri Sidramaya Ji, Justice N.V. Anjariya, Chief Justice of the High Court of Karnataka, Judges of the High Court, Sri Harisha A., President Karnataka State Judicial Officers Association, Sri H.K. Navina, General Secretary, Karnataka State Judicial Officers Association, all the judges in the district judiciary, ladies and gentlemen. Yellaragu Namaskara Matu Nana Rutupurvaka Shubhashayagalu Karnataka Rajadhani Yada, E. Sundar Bengaluru Nagarake, Beti Nidi, Matome Nimelara Naduve, Bandirudu, Bahala Santosha Vagide, I share a close affinity with the state of Karnataka and the charming city of Bangalore. I've had the privilege of visiting the city several times. I think I'm almost a veteran in this auditorium. I've been here four times before at least, and this is my fifth visit here. <laughs> Bangalore often serves as an escape from the extreme heat or cold weather in Delhi. And as the elections come near, the heat tends to increase in Delhi naturally. <laughs> I believe that the cliché about the famous Bangalore weather is also symbolic of its people. Just like the weather, the people of Bangalore are measured, pleasant, and extremely hospitable. I see that reflection in each of my very three personally friendly colleagues who I have a great deal in common with. I'm delighted to be back, and I hope to immerse myself in the vibrant culture of the city over the next few days. Well, I always say that, you know, when I'm garlanded with this big garland in Bangalore, and I wear the feta, I truly feel that I'm a son-in-law in Bangalore. <laughs> but which is true in reality as well, because my my... In-laws, both of them, after retirement from government service, settled down in Bangalore. My mother-in-law and my sisters-in-law still stay here. So I'm truly, I think, a son-in-law of the city. But I have a deeper connection. My father's brother-in-law, Adya Rangacharya, who was known by the pen name of Sri Ranga, he lived between 1904 and 1984 and received the Padma Bhushan. He wrote 72 plays, 72 plays in Kannada. And his plays speak about the need for social transformation. What he said when he wrote those plays, he was awarded with the Sahitya Academy Award for his Kalidasa. He translated the Natya Shastra into English. All those visions for social transformation are so true even for us today. And his daughter, my cousin, Shashi Deshpande, was a noted English writer who also lives in Bangalore, and she was awarded the Padma Shri for her writing in English. My father's first cousin had a matrimonial home in Dharwad, and as a young child, we would, I would accompany my parents in our old 1966 model ambassador driving from Mumbai to Dharwad to spend so many vacations. But more about this topic. Jila Nyayangavu Namma Kanunu Vyavastheya Benelubu Hagu Nyayada Adalitada Muladhara Yendu 
ನಾನು ಬಲವಾಗಿ ನಂಬುತ್ತೇನೆ ಐ ಟ್ರೂಲಿ ಬಿಲೀವ್ ದಟ್ ದ ಡಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿಕ್ಟ್ ಜುಡಿಷರಿ ಇಸ್ ಅ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಬೋನ್ ಆಫ್ ಆರ್ ಲೀಗಲ್ ಸಿಸ್ಟಮ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದಿ ಕಾರ್ನರ್ ಸ್ಟೋನ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಅಡ್ಮಿನಿಸ್ಟ್ರೇಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಜಸ್ಟಿಸ್ ಅದು ನಮ್ಮ ನಗರಿಕರಿಗೆ ಸಂಪರ್ಕದ ಮೊದಲ ಬಿಂದು ಯು ಆರ್ ದ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಕಾಂಟ್ಯಾಕ್ಟ್ ಫಾರ್ ಆರ್ ಸಿಟಿಸನ್ಸ್ ಹೂ ಅಪ್ರೋಚ್ ದ ಕೋರ್ಟ್ ನ್ಯಾಯಾಂಗ ಅಧಿಕಾರಗಳಿಗಾಗಿ ನ್ಯಾಯದ ವಿತರಣೆಯಲ್ಲಿ ಪ್ರಮುಖ ಪಾತ್ರವನ್ನು ವಹಿಸುತ್ತೀರಿ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದೇಫ್ ಆರ್ ಮೈ ಪ್ರಿವಿಲೇಜ್ ಟು ಇನಾಗ್ರೇಟ್ ದ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಬಯನಿಯಲ್ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ ಲೆವೆಲ್ ಕಾನ್ಫರೆನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಜುಡಿಷಿಯಲ್ ಆಫೀಸರ್ಸ್ ಆನ್ ದ ಟಾಪಿಕಲ್ ಥೀಮ್ ಎಕ್ವಿಟಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಎಕ್ಸಲೆನ್ಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಅ ಫ್ಯೂಚರಿಸ್ಟಿಕ್ ಜುಡಿಷರಿ ಆಸ್ ಜಡ್ಜಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಹೈಕೋರ್ಟ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಸುಪ್ರೀಂ ಕೋರ್ಟ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಆಫನ್ ಪರ್ಸೀವ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಡಿಟ್ಯಾಚ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದ ರಿಯಾಲಿಟೀಸ್ ಇನ್ ಆರ್ ಡಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿಕ್ಟ್ ಕೋರ್ಟ್ಸ್ ದ ಕಾನ್ವರ್ಸೇಷನ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಜುಡಿಷಿಯಲ್ ರಿಫಾರ್ಮ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇಶ್ಯೂಸ್ ಅಫೆಕ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಆರ್ ಜಡ್ಜಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಆಫನ್ ಲಿಮಿಟೆಡ್ ಟು ಅ ಡಯಲಾಗ್ ಬಿಟ್ವೀನ್ ದ ಸುಪ್ರೀಂ ಕೋರ್ಟ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಹೈಕೋರ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಕಾನ್ಫರೆನ್ಸಸ್ ಸಚ್ ಆಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಸರ್ವ್ ಎಸ್ ಅ ಡಿಪಾರ್ಚರ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದಿಸ್ ಟೆಂಡೆನ್ಸಿ ರೆಕಗ್ನೈಸಿಂಗ್ ದಟ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಆರ್ ಡಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿಕ್ಟ್ ಜಡ್ಜಸ್ ಹೂ ಆರ್ ದ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಕಾಂಟ್ಯಾಕ್ಟ್ ಫಾರ್ ಆರ್ ಸಿಟಿಸನ್ಸ್ ಆಸ್ ದ ಪ್ರೀವಿಯಸ್ ಸ್ಪೀಕರ್ ಸೆಡ್ ರೀಸೆಂಟ್ಲಿ ದ ಸುಪ್ರೀಂ ಕೋರ್ಟ್ ಇನ್ ಕೊಲಾಬರೇಷನ್ ವಿತ್ ದ ಗುಜರಾತ್ ಹೈಕೋರ್ಟ್ ಆರ್ಗನೈಸ್ ದಿ ಆಲ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಡಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿಕ್ಟ್ ಜಡ್ಜಸ್ ಕಾನ್ಫರೆನ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಕಚ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಪ್ಲಾನಿಂಗ್ ಅನದರ್ ಕಾನ್ಫರೆನ್ಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಡಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿಕ್ಟ್ ಜಡ್ಜಸ್ ಆಲ್ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ಅ ಥೌಸಂಡ್ ಡಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿಕ್ಟ್ ಜಡ್ಜಸ್ ಇನ್ ಡೆಲ್ಲಿ ಆಸ್ ವೆಲ್ ದ ಟಾಪಿಕ್ ಫಾರ್ ದಿಸ್ ಕಾನ್ಫರೆನ್ಸ್ ಆನ್ ದ ಥೀಮ್ ಇಸ್ ಎಕ್ವಿಟಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಎಕ್ಸಲೆನ್ಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಅ ಫ್ಯೂಚರಿಸ್ಟಿಕ್ ಜುಡಿಷರಿ ವಾಟ್ ಯು ವಿ ಮೀನ್ ಬೈ ಫ್ಯೂಚರಿಸ್ಟಿಕ್ ಬೈ ಫ್ಯೂಚರಿಸ್ಟಿಕ್ ವಿ ಮೀನ್ ಎ ಮಾಡರ್ನ್ ಜುಡಿಷರಿ ಬಟ್ ಅಬವ್ ಆಲ್ ಎ ಜುಡಿಷರಿ ವಿಚ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಮೀಟ್ ದ ಚಾಲೆಂಜಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಆರ್ ಟೈಮ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದೋಸ್ ಚಾಲೆಂಜಸ್ ಆರ್ ನೆವರ್ ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಟಿಕ್ those challenges are to respond to the evolution and the rapid progress which is being made in our societies but when we talk about equity we go back to the foundational values of our constitution we speak we speak about excellence our work ethic both individually as judges and institutionally as all of us put together but above all we also must focus in equity on social transformation the social values which our work embodies every day of our lives because as judges we have an equal role to play in the transformation of our societies at a certain level we come to court every day we deal with those cases involving order 39 applications applications for bail and anticipatory bail execution petitions maintenance and what have you not claims for compensation under the motor vehicles act but there is something more fundamental which is going on in every case that we decide and that in every case that we decide we represent the quest for justice and through justice we seek to bring about a social transformation in the world around us so make no bones about it that you as key participants in the judicial process have a vital role to play in the social transformation which is taking place not only in karnataka but across india and globally i must appreciate that the themes for our conference are well curated and reflect several important issues that warrant larger discussion including the issues and challenges in civil and criminal trials i'm amazed when i learned of the statistics which brother justice arvind kumar put for you on the screen as chairperson of the e committee i also keep a watch on the statistics for disposal and institution between 1st of january 2023 to 23rd of march 2024 21.25 lakh cases were instituted in the district judiciary in karnataka 20.62 lakh cases have been disposed of so we are only short by a few thousand cases behind the curve but across india this is really a performance to replicate and to emulate all over the country 
And therefore, I join the previous speakers in complimenting all of you, the members of the district judiciary, in the work which you have done. The government of Karnataka has also to be appreciated in terms of its constant support for the infrastructure and growth of the district judiciary. I just received a message from one of my colleagues, Justice Suresh Govindraj of the High Court, that the government of Karnataka has sanctioned 10 crores of rupees for e-seva kendras. Each of them will be 300 square feet at the rate of 14 lakhs per e-seva kendra. Brother Justice Bopanna highlighted a very important aspect, that in the march of technology, we should not leave any citizen behind. Because there is an internet divide. The government of Karnataka has sanctioned laptops for all government pleaders and judicial personnel who man their litigation in the courts. But every one of our lawyers does not necessarily have a laptop or even a smartphone. Now, how do we ensure that technology does not leave anybody behind? That we intend to do by providing these e-seva kendras in which every conceivable facility in terms of information and con communications technology is made available to each citizen who accesses justice. I'm particularly pleased to see the inclusion of a session focused on work-life balance and stress management. The capacity to manage stress is significant in the life of a judge, especially for district judges. As judicial officers, you regularly engage with vulnerable litigants, many of whom look to you for justice. Many of the people who come to us are stressed about the injustice which has been caused to you, caused to them. And sometimes in their dealings with us as judges, they cross the line. As Chief Justice of India, I see so many lawyers and litigants crossing the line when they speak to us in the court. The answer when these litigants cross the line is not to use the power of contempt, but to understand why they have crossed the line. There must be some deep-rooted injustice which they are confronting, which is why they sometimes say things which they do not otherwise want to say, as so many times happens within our own families. In these contexts, the responsibility you carry is immense, necessitating a calm and compassionate approach. Maintaining a work-life balance is integral to fulfilling these duties effectively. A judge who is overwhelmed with work and unable to prioritize personal time with family and self-care may struggle to perform optimally. Therefore, the ability to manage stress and achieve work-life balance is not separate from, but rather intertwined with delivering justice completely. They always tell physicians and surgeons Physician, heal thyself, because before you heal others, you must learn how to heal yourself. The same is true about judges as well. You heal others. You bring peace to conflicting disputes and disputants. But you must first learn to heal yourself when you heal others. We live in difficult times. We live in times of the social media where work which we do is being constantly assessed. The Supreme Court of India has put all its important hearings on a live streaming platform, and we are watched all over the country. But we can also be trolled as a result of that. I'll just give you one example. Just four or five days ago, when I was hearing a case, I had a little pain in the back. So all that I did was I placed my elbows in my armchair in the court, and I just shifted my position in the chair. That video was doctored so as to delete that part of what followed thereafter. And there was a big amount of social media comment that the Chief Justice of India is so arrogant that he got up in the midst of an argument, an important argument in the court. What they didn't tell you was that all that he did was only to shift his position in the chair. 24 years of judging can be a little strenuous, as I have put in. But I didn't leave the court. I only shifted my position in the chair. But I was subject to vicious abuse, trolling. The knives were out. But I do believe that our shoulders are broad enough. 
And the ultimate confidence which we have is of common citizens in the work which we do. But I understand that this is the position of the Chief Justice of India. Judges in Taluka courts don't have the kind of protection which we have. I've heard of stories where in my parent state, the state of Maharashtra, a young judge, civil judge, junior division is told by a member of the bar, if you don't behave with me, I'll ensure that the high court transfers you from this station. In other states, when I was chief justice of the state of Uttar Pradesh, the high court of judicature at Allahabad, there were some stories which I constantly heard every day about the manner in which Young judges, middle-level judges, and senior judges were treated. You belong, you are blessed to belong to a state where these stories are only heard about and not witnessed during your day-to-day -day work. But I do understand the difficulties through which you travel when you do your work every day. Although there are points of conversions, most of the problems plaguing the district courts significantly differ from those affecting the high courts and the Supreme Court. In fact, given the plurality of experiences in our country, the issues faced by one district court are often incomparable even with the court in the neighboring district. In such a scenario, it is a methodology that we use to diagnose the problems plaguing our district judiciary, which assumes immense importance. The answer lies in comprehensive data collection and research. A famous American statistician has said, in God we trust, all others must bring data. For a long period, our inability to address the diverse problems affecting the district judiciary arose from the lack of data on the cases, pendency, and infrastructural gaps in the district courts across the country. Today, the National Judicial Data Grid, or NJDG, acts as a comprehensive database, providing real-time data on district courts on an online platform. The NJDG works as a monitoring tool to identify, manage, and reduce the pendency of cases. We have set up the iJuris platform, which gives us a real-time evaluation of the infrastructure in the district judiciary. The Supreme Court, too, has several teams which are working towards institutional reform. The E-Committee of the Supreme Court and the Computer Cell have spearheaded several projects that seek to bridge this gap using modern technology to improve the quality of data, its collection, and analysis to devise judicial reforms. The Center for Research and Planning of the Supreme Court is a team of officers and professionals. I have a woman judicial officer from the judicial service in the state of Haryana and a host of almost 18 young lawyers who have been recruited for two years as law interns and law researchers from different states who have been deputed for the purpose of studying institutional challenges to the district judiciary. In November last year, the Supreme Court released a report on the state of the judiciary, a rigorous study of justice delivery efforts in high courts in the district judiciary across the country. The report covered four important aspects of the functioning of the district judiciary, namely judicial infrastructure, budgeting, human resource management, and the ICT infrastructure. Such rigorous data collection and research are essential to overcome the first obstacle to judicial reform at the district level, which is accurately ascertaining the situation across various states and identifying the problems. I'm hopeful that all of you in the audience today will actively engage with the various research-centric initiatives of the Supreme Court. By doing so, we cannot only bring the Supreme Court closer to you, but also contribute to the effective reform in the district courts. But there is another reason for data-driven policies. Our governments, the government of Karnataka is no exception, spend large amounts of money on the district judiciary. How do we justify the expenditure of public revenues on the Indian judiciary. How do we assess the impact of that expenditure which is incurred in our functioning? We must have objective yardsticks to assess what is our output, what is the quality of the work which we are rendering, and how different are we making the lives of citizens 
by the expenditure and investment of public, ex public revenues in the work which we do. One of the sub-themes of today's conference is women and the judiciary. I must highlight that the data with regard to the representation of women in the district judiciary is heartening and signifies tremendous progress. Across India, women constitute almost 37% of the working strength of the district judiciary. In particular, the data on recruitment of the district judiciary in Karnataka paints an optimistic picture. Out of the total working strength of 447 civil judges, 200 judicial officers are women, constituting approximately 44% of the working strength. Karnataka, in that sense, is leading the social transformation across India. Increasing representation of women judicial officers is crucial not only to correct a historic lack of representation in our courts, but also to bring diverse perspectives and experiences to the table, resulting in a more effective adjudication process. As I look into the audience, I can see a large number of women judicial officers present. Your contribution to the judiciary is of immense importance, and you serve as a source of inspiration for, for future generations of women aspiring to pursue careers in law and the Indian judiciary. An increase in the number of women judicial officers is undoubtedly an essential step to creating an inclusive and representative judiciary. However, a mere increase in the number of women is not sufficient. The next step is to create an atmosphere that is conducive for women judicial officers to carry out their functions effectively without hindrances and as equal participants in the justice delivery mechanism. Creating such an inclusive atmosphere requires active efforts from all quarters, the government, the high court, and most of all, fellow male judicial officers as well. Our courtrooms, both in terms of physical infrastructure and in their effective functioning, were traditionally tailored to suit the realities of a biological man. There was a time when our district courts did not even have the facility of a separate washroom for women. Today, over 80% of district courts across India have a separate women's washroom. However, it must be highlighted that women have distinct sanitation needs compared to men, especially with regard to menstrual hygiene. Therefore, it is not enough to have separate washrooms. Such washrooms must also be female-friendly, providing for their unique sanitation needs. Only a meager 6.7% of district courts across India have washrooms that are female-friendly and have the facility of sanitary napkin vending machines. Almost four years ago, the Karnataka High Court installed sanitary napkin vending machines on the recommendation of my sister, Justice Nagaratna. Such initiatives must not be restricted to only our Supreme Court and the High Courts, but also spread to our district courts across the nation. It is the courts at the district level that act as the first point of contact for a woman litigant and serve as a workplace for thousands of women lawyers, judicial officers, and staff. We must not forget the women staff who are working in the district judiciary. They require these facilities equally with lawyers and judges. The conference includes a discussion on challenges in civil and criminal trials. Generally, Constitutional courts are widely regarded as bastions that safeguard fundamental rights and ensure constitutional protection. However, I believe that the role and duty of district courts and judicial officers in upholding fundamental rights, such as the right to life and liberty under Article 21, is often far greater and more immediate than the constitutional courts. District courts serve as the initial layer of protection for citizens entangled in the criminal justice system, guaranteeing adherence to proper arrest protocols, conducting medical examinations, ensuring dignified treatment, protecting rights against self-incrimination, and facilitating access to family and legal counsel. 
as you carry out your duties as judicial officers, this profound commitment to not only the letter of the law, but also the spirit of the Constitution must never be overlooked or underestimated. It's important that all of you provide mentorship to younger judges. Mentorship is not through only your administrative judges in the high courts. You must sit together as a team and encourage the younger members of the judiciary who are joining the fraternity. We are carefully looking at the service conditions of the district judiciary. As was mentioned a short while ago, under a direction and judgment of the Supreme Court, the second National Judicial Pay Commission recommendations were implemented with effect from 2016. What is the rationale for this? We are not a trade union of judges. The rationale for dignified conditions of service for our district judiciary is that our conditions of service define the independence and integrity of the judiciary. When our district judiciary knows that post-retirement they will be able to live in conditions of dignity, they will be independent in the work which they do today. Just three days ago, we had a case of a woman judicial officer, a district judge who was elevated to the high court with a small break. Her pension was fixed on the basis of her last drawn salary as a district judge. And she was told that because there was a break in your service, it's not your last drawn salary as a high court judge which will determine your pension. She is in her 80s, I believe, and she's suffering from cancer. Look at the plight of somebody who has served the nation in the district judiciary, fighting at that age for the determination of pension. And in our judgment, we said that you cannot have this distinction between service judges who come to the high court and bar judges. Bar judges are entitled to an addition of 10 years in the computation of their pension if they don't fulfill the qualifying requirement for pension. But on the other hand, a district judge was told that your pension will be on the basis of the last drawn salary. We said this distinction, the birthmarks between service judges and bar judges has to be erased when you become judges of one institution. <laughs> Medical treatment. We have provided in our judgment that we must provide cashless medical treatment for our district judges and for their dependent families, aged parents who depend upon them for support. But something very interesting was narrated to us by a team of district judges who are just in our court to observe the proceedings. They say, sir, it's very well to say that you will provide cashless treatment, but in many states in India, and I'm not speaking about Karnataka, I'm speaking as Chief Justice of India, in many states, the hospitals for cashless treatment are selected by inviting tenders. So the L1 bidder gets the contract. Now the L1 bidder always works on volume. So they will try and reduce the bid quoted so as to get the contract and then compromise on the quality of the treatment. So these are small issues and therefore we directed that the high courts must constitute a permanent committee consisting of two senior judges of the High Court, the Finance Secretary, the Health Secretary, and the collectors of each district so that you can identify those hospitals which are truly, truly capable of pro proper treatment for our judicial officers. I'm thinking very seriously of career educational advancement, advancement for our judicial officers. Why should we not invite more and more judicial officers to curate postgraduate degree programs during the course of their service, so as to enable them to understand how the world around us is shaping and reshaping our lives. Before concluding, I would like to quote the famous playwright and novelist, Dr. Shivram Karanth, famously called the Rabindra Tagore of modern India. And Dr. Karanth in a, poet, in a poem wrote, Marada, Mele kulita hakige, kombe murida biluva bhayavirudu, yekendare adu nama biruvudu, tanna reke galane horatu kombe anala, hage hage namma 
ಸಾಮರ್ಥ್ಯದ ಮೇಲೆ ನಮಗೆ ಸದಾ ಆತ್ಮವಿಶ್ವಾಸವಿರಲಿ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ರೀಸೆಂಟ್ಲಿ ಅಪಾಯಿಂಟೆಡ್ ಜಾರ್ಜ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಕರ್ನಾಟಕ ಹೈಕೋರ್ಟ್ ಫ್ರಾಮ್ ದ ಹೈಕೋರ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಕೇರಳ ಅವರ್ ಸಿಸ್ಟರ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಅನು ಸಿವರಾಮನ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ನಾಟ್ ಶೋ ವೆದರ್ ಸಿಸ್ಟರ್ ಅನು ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಸ್ಟಿಲ್ ಪಿಕ್ಟ್ ಅಪ್ ದ ನ್ಯೂಯನ್ಸಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಕನ್ನಡ ಸೊ ಐ ವಿಲ್ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸ್ಲೇಟ್ ದ ಪೋಯಮ್ ವಿಚ್ ಐ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ನರೇಟೆಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಶಿವರಾಮ್ ಕರಂತ್ ವಾಟ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಶಿವರಾಮ್ ಕರಂತ್ ಸೇಜ್ ಇಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಶಿವರಾಮ್ ಕರಂತ್ ಸೇಜ್ ಇಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ದ ಬರ್ಡ್ ಸಿಟ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಆನ್ ದ ಟ್ರೀ ದೆರ್ ಇಸ್ ನೋ ಫಿಯರ್ ಆಫ್ ಫಾಲೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಬ್ರಾಂಚ್ ಬ್ರೇಕಿಂಗ್ the bird trusts its wings and not the branch similarly we should always have confidence in our own abilities as judicial officers each one of you must keep these words of dr karanth in mind you have been endowed with an important responsibility to do justice without fear or favor and please remember this without fear or favor when you decide to grant bail to people who are yearning for the grant of personal liberty do it without favor but equally important do it without fear have faith have faith in your abilities and do not hesitate to make bold decisions while adjudicating the cases before you the branches beneath your wings the high court and the supreme court are there to support you but you must also have confidence in your own ability to soar so then may i conclude by saying nimma mundina prayatnagalalli nanu nimage shubha haraisutene ellarigu dhanyavadulugu namaskar well ladies and gentlemen it was indeed a highly inspiring and motivating and at the same time the honorable chief justice of india has called upon the entire fraternity to realize their importance of social transformation let's all once again give a huge huge round of applause ladies and gentlemen